Right, thank you very much for that, uh, Dave. And uh, like I say, you have heard a bit of, about Shazu already, but uh, very, very briefly, I first came across Shazu about two and a half years ago when uh, she appeared with her mother in the Parkinson's UK magazine. And uh, we started chatting on social media. I thought she'd be absolutely ideal for the, the Carer's White paper. Um, she's, as you can see, she's charming, she's intelligent. She's not, she's gonna, don't get embarrassed, it's all true, don't worry about it. But she's also very, very humble as well. Um, this is, we're going to tell her story now, but uh, in your own words, Shazia, what was life like before your mum was diagnosed with Parkinson's? Um, so as an only child, I've always been incredibly close to my mum, and she was my best friend, and she still is. Um, we used to do everything together, and then just one day when I turned nine, gradually over the over uh, some short months, our whole lives just turned upside down. What were what, what were her symptoms, and how did you come to sort of become first refer referred to a specialist doctor? Um, so her left side of the body started shaking, and that was mostly noticeable in her like arm and hand, really. So I used to have to hold onto when we were walking just in the shops or just walking down the street um, but we didn't think anything of it um, and then it gradually became worse and she went to see the GP um, and she had a fall in a bath um, in May 2004 um, and then they thought she'd had a stroke that night in the bath so it actually took two years for her to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease eventually after every scan and blood test under the sun. That's that's an awfully long time to take for diagnosis. Did you actually know anything about Parkinson's before you actually um, she was diagnosed at all? No, not at all. Um, there's no family history. Um, at that time, there wasn't anyway. But since then, um, my mum's cousin also was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and he unfortunately passed away last year. Um, but at the time, there wasn't anything that I'd learnt in school or anything on television that we'd come across, or even my mum hadn't heard of it before. What sort of things did you have to do for your mum, or what things did you do for your mum as a young as a young child before she was diagnosed? Um, so, before she was diagnosed, obviously there was no treatment that was given, so I gradually started helping her a bit more with the cooking, just um, because her fine motor skills were deteriorating, so it was just things like peeling um, and chopping vegetables or fruit, um, holding on to her arm, her weaker side, so to speak, more and more often, and then just sort of pacing ourselves more slowly when we were walking, just to give her more time. And did the healthcare professionals give you any advice as to what you should be doing or what you could help, how you could help her at all? No, um, not at all, really. I don't think they even considered me to be her carer or until I was 16, I don't think I was really taken very seriously by the consultants involved in her care. Right, so how did, how did this affect you at school then? How did you have to tell your teachers or um, how did it help? How, what, how did it affect you when I, you were at school? I kept it quite hidden. I think before on the tape you heard um, that I used to get quite um, angry, that why is it my mum, and quite selfish, but I think that was just sort of a bit of a child mentality as well. Um, as to why it's my mum and why isn't she healthy anymore and what is this disease that's come out of nowhere and has affected us both. Um, and I think it was when I was 14, 15, my mum ended up in hospital um, for quite a long period that I told my best friend in secondary school and I told my favourite teacher um, that my mum's got Parkinson's disease and, you know, this is this is what's been going on. But before that, my mum had obviously made my form tutor aware and like my head of year aware that she was ill and you know that I might want to accompany her to appointments and they were really understanding about it. But the whole class or anyone at school, I didn't really announce it mm. to my larger group of friends or anything. I just kept it secret. How did that make you feel actually sort of knowing that you'd actually peop other people knew and was it a weight off your shoulders or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my best friend, um, she's actually, two of her siblings have autism. Um, so that sort of brought us closer, actually, just mm -hmm. talking about our caring experiences and how it can be great at times and not so great at other times. Does it, did it ever make you feel sort of a bit lonely or depressed, having to look after your mum, and knowing that only a few people at school knew, but essentially you, 
you're on your own pretty much when you're all the time looking after your mum. Yeah, definitely. I think especially when um, there were more stressful periods at school as well, like close to exams and deadlines um, for coursework, I did feel, you know, oh, damn, I've got all of this work to do and I still have to look after my mum as well. And, you know, I felt quite isolated and I couldn't really talk to anyone about it because apart from, like, my best friend, I didn't know many other carers who were also going through a similar situation to myself. Did you have any hobbies and interests that you enjoyed? Or were you able to enjoy them, in fact? And uh, did, did you have a chance to go on holiday at all? Um, not even now. I've not been able to go on holiday abroad just because it's so difficult trying to find someone um, to look after my mum overnight because it's me and her. And with hobbies, um, I think... I try and like give myself more time now that I'm not studying and it's easier to have that work-life balance, whereas before it was much more difficult because you've still got all the revision and coursework to do when you get home as well. Now, having met your mum and having met you, I know obviously how close you are to your mum. You both have a very, very caring nature. How do you feel she copes with the role reversal now? Because obviously she was to care for you when you were younger. And now things are kind of kind of turned table a bit, haven't they? I think she can get incredibly frustrated by it. I think before um, on the presentation you heard when I said that no one expects to get Parkinson's an incurable condition at the age of 20, 30. No, it, no one ever factors that into their no. <laughs> life plan. Um, and I think she hates being a burden, but I don't see it that way at all. I just see it as... I've grown up being a carer and I just look at the positives really because if you didn't, then what else can you do? There's no point being negative because you're not going to get anything out of it. Uh, it's a very, very positive way of looking at it. think you feel you've learnt new sort of life skills in, in your role as a carer, like sort of empathy or patience, because certainly I know, and I'm going to remember my own personal experience in it because it's quite bizarre interviewing a carer of somebody with Parkinson's actually having Parkinson's yourself, as I'm sure you'd, you'd probably agree, but I know how frustrating it can be if you sort of arrange to do something and then at the last minute you can't because your symptoms are too bad. How do you cope with that? Do you get frustrated? I mean, I'd like to know personally because obviously it gives me insights into how carers, do, you know. How, do, you, do you feel disappointed? Do you feel let down or do you just, is it just something that happens and you get it, on with it? It's just something that happens and usually that there can be a plan B. Like if I've planned to go out for a meal with friends and my mum isn't feeling that great, then fine. Some of them, sometimes they can come over and we'll have like a baking masterclass at home instead. <laughs> so it works out well in the end. Um, but I, I think, again, my mum feels quite guilty that I can't live life to the fullest compared to other people my age or just anyone in general. But I don't see it that way because I know if I was in that position, she'd do exactly the same for me. What have you done? Have you have you gone to learn about Parkinson's? What did you, what have you done? Have you had access to information? Where, where did you go to try and get your information to learn about the condition in general? Um, so when I started identifying with my caring role more was when my mum was in hospital and I spoke um, earlier about telling my best friend and my teacher at uh, around the age of 15. Um, I went on the Parkinson's UK website and the forum on there is really helpful. Like I post as much as I can, but I read the posts on there really regularly um, just to gauge insight onto what other carers find in different situations and sort of the symptoms that might not be discussed with a healthcare professional as much, just day-to-day -day lifestyle things. Uh, that was going I was going on to my next question. You interact with other carers but and use social media to get better insights, but of course you do, and it's yeah. it's invaluable, I think, and you obviously use it to the very right respect in the very right way. Um in your role as a carer though, what do you see as your biggest challenge? Um I think it's just the uncertainty. Um but that's more of like the Parkinson's and the caring role itself. It's just mm -hmm. learning to adapt with whatever is to come with my mum's condition and making sure that I can be the best carer possible. But there's nothing that can really prepare you for it. Yeah. One of the, notice when we were around at your house doing the interviews in the first place, 
one of the loveliest pictures on the wall is, is a picture of you and your mum at your graduation. And congratulations, <laughs> by the way. Um, why, what set you up to do that degree in the first place? You did, it's a biology degree, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I graduated um, from Manchester in biology in 2015. Um, and it was during my A-levels when we learnt more about the nervous system. And um, I'd always sort of had an interest in like biology anyway with all the Attenborough <laughs> documentaries. <laughs> um, but it was just, I wanted to make an impact. I know there's, unfortunately, there's no cure for Parkinson's at the moment. And I wanted to make sure that I could make a difference. On a general note, do you think, the role of carers is appreciated, or do you think it's rather swept under the carpet? And, and essentially, you are, you are the invisible army, as, as our white paper suggests. Um, I think, unfortunately, is swept under the carpet, and I really hope that this amazing um, white paper is going to do something to change that, really, across healthcare. Um, especially, I think, young carers. Even school can be a tough time anyway, and then to have the caring role added on top of that is just, it's really tough. And finally, I'm possibly shorter than we anticipated, but finally, I know your mum is amazingly proud of you and what you've done and how you help her, but uh, what makes you proud of your mum? I just think the fight that she has with this illness, as you would know more than anyone else every day, and that she still keeps a smile on her face, she still asks me how my day was when I get home, regardless of how bad she's feeling. And she always tells me not to worry. And I just, to have faced that illness when you're 41 and to just, t she's just taken it in her stride completely, not to know what the next day or the next hour or the next 10 minutes is going to bring you in terms of symptoms. And she always has a smile on her face. As do you, Shazia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Shazia Dar. Thank you.